Hi, I'm Jack Coyer. I'm glad you could join us today. I'm the senior photographer and videographer for Garden Gate magazine. I'm responsible for providing images for the magazine and videos for our YouTube page. Uh, we have a test garden here in town where we do a lot of our shooting. We also have relationships with a lot of local gardeners that we shoot with. And we have a great uh, botanic garden in town that we do a lot of our work in. Uh, on typical years, we take 10 or 12 trips across the country, uh, shooting in um, private gardens, public gardens, interviewing gardeners, creating videos. Uh, this year was a little different. We didn't get on the road as much. With this seminar, I want to provide you with a fresh, some fresh ideas for your photography in your personal garden. I want you to take the time to see the natural world in a different way, understand how the light hits your garden, and take your photographs to the next level. Now there are technical aspects that we'll touch on, but what I feel the most important lesson you can take from this is learning how to see the light and analyze the light and read the light and what that light does to plant material and what that plant and what that light does to your garden. So let's get started. So we're going to start out today with a concept of analyzing the light. So when you step in your garden or if you're on a tour or a garden walk, first thing I want you to do is analyze the light. Where is the light coming from and where is the light going? You, you can start reading that and you can train your eye to understand what the light is doing. So there is uh, backlight, my first slide here, where the subject, your flower or your garden, is between you and the light source or the sun in this situation. For me, this is the most ideal light. Um, sometimes it's tricky to shoot in this light. You're looking into the sun, so sometimes you have to use a tree branch to block the sun or your hand, but early in the morning, late in the day is the most ideal time to shoot in the garden. You'll get nice long shadows, um, subtle highlights, rim light on the petals and on the foliage. It's definitely the best light for the garden. Uh, top light is when the light source is midday, the sun is right on top of you, and it's blasting right down on your garden. Not great for plant material, okay? There's deep, harsh shadows, there's highlights, things get washed out. Uh, you try to avoid this if at all possible. I mean, sometimes you're stuck in a garden or you're visiting somewhere and this is the only light you have, so go ahead and shoot. But if you have a chance to come back in the morning or that evening, uh, I would do that if it's, if it's something that you really want nice photographs of. Um, the only caveat of that is top light, but if it's overcast, if you have a cloud and it's diffusing the sunlight, there's, that eliminates the shadow and you can pretty much shoot all day on an overcast day and you're not going to get uh, harsh shadows. You'll be able to see the plant material very well and um, you'll get very usable images in that um, type of atmosphere environment. Uh, front light is um, when the light is behind you and blasting right on the subject. Uh, most of the time it's not ideal. Um, if it's lower in the sky and uh, you can eliminate some of the shadows, it, you know, it works okay. And I'll show you some examples where, you know, it works okay. But if the light is behind you, turn around so the light's coming into the camera, right? So in the early morning or late afternoon, depending on where you are, you can either um, have front light or backlight. Choose the backlight. Now here's some examples um, I'll show you with backlighting. These are two of my favorite images from the magazine that I photographed. The one on the left, the cone flowers. Um, this was uh, fairly early in the morning. It was um, a perfect storm, if, you, if I could say so. The light was just coming up um, in the morning and there was a slight overcast. So it was slightly diffused, but there was still a lot of, uh, but there was still some direction to the light. As you can see, the highlights on top of the cone flowers and the background was soft and out of focus and sort of blown out. I think that's a beautiful image and that's a perfect example of what uh, backlight can do for you. Um, the image on the right, the verbena and the butterfly weed is um, late in the day, but you can see how the highlight, the, 
the stem of the verbena and the top of the verbena is just highlighting. It stands out and it just gives it a separation from the background. So this is the type of light you want to look for. The next image, similar backlighting situation. It's a little bit more direct on the left. You can see the ferns being lit and the, the red foliage being illuminated, the light coming through, um, just creating um, beautiful highlights and um, wonderful color, pops of color. Uh, and on the right, the Rudbeckia, you can see in the background in the upper right hand corner of that image where the sun is setting, but it's still giving, it's not a direct light onto the, onto the Rudbeckia, but it's still giving a nice highlight and the petals, the flower petals toward the back are still being illuminated and it's a shallow focus. So it's a really ideal light at that situation. On these two images, the flowers are much smaller. So it's more of a meadow scene and it's late in the day for both of these images, but you can see the illumination, the light from behind backlit, giving the petals and the um, foliage just some nice, wonderful highlights, especially on the one on the right. You want to look for those little slivers of light that are just maybe hitting a few of the flower petals or flew a few of the blooms, and it just makes it stand out. And it gives it that warm glow that you want, um, that you're looking for. So, you know, train your eye to see those little slivers of light that are perhaps coming through a tree or coming around a building or something like that, that um, creates sort of a shaft of light there. That's what you want to find and that's what you want to look for. This backlight situation is a larger scene. Um, the other, the previous ones were, you know, more close up. So this larger scene is um, the sun is setting. It's um, not directly backlit, but it's a little off to the left. Um, but there's still a sliver of light highlighting some of the foliage and the red uh, echinacea or cone flower. But it's not so harsh that it's blasted with light and it makes it too bright because you still see definition in the shadows but it just gives it a nice movement, a nice feel, and just something that um, your eye gravitates towards. Now, I do use a DSLR professional camera, but even if you're using your phone, just keep all of these things in mind. Look for the light, because your phone will take a great picture as well, but if you uh, put that phone in the right position with the right light, your images will be much better. Here's another backlight situation. This was early in the morning and um, the sun is really bright as you can see in the left um, side of the frame and it's coming through the trees. But it's not so much that it's flaring the lens or <clears throat> uh, blasting into the lens, but it's giving a nice feel to the image and it um, really highlights the fall colors of this image. So this is shooting directly into the sun maybe a little bit off to the side, but it just um, gives the whole image a nice feel and um, a nice setting. Here's another larger scene uh, with backlight. Now, when you're thinking about this, or looking at this image, the backlight is more on those back, on the black plant material and the shrubs in the back. Um, the checkerboard planting paving in the middle is still in open shade. The sun isn't high enough to reach in there, but what this backlight does, you can see it through the tree, the, the brightness between through the trees there. What this does is just kind of gives that checkerboard a frame. It highlights those, that plant material on the back of the border and it just kind of encloses that and um, gives that uh, checkerboard a frame. I think it works really well. So there's backlight in tight situations and there's backlight in larger garden scenes as well. Now here's two images that were taken, you know, within seconds of each other. Um, it's a succulent. This was in, um, we were on a trip to Boise, Idaho and it's late in the day. And you can see the image on the left, it's backlit, it's very beautiful. You can see the highlight in the sky back there, but just a slight movement and the sun is more predominant. There's a little bit more flare. That's what you call camera flare. And, you know, sometimes that gives a nice feel to your image. So you don't necessarily have to eliminate, eliminate that, you know, take a couple shots that shows a little flare because it might, 
it gives it a nice mood and a nice highlight and it's maybe a little bit more dramatic so don't be afraid to, to feel or move around a little bit and you know um, rotate your camera just to touch so let a little light come in there because you might get a very good result Okay, now here's an example. I was in the garden recently, and I took this shot early in the morning. This is a zinnia. The background soft. It's morning light. You can see on the lower petals, the, some of the light is coming through, making the petals translucent. Um, but I also came back in the middle of the day and showed and shot it top light to show you the difference and how washed out it is, and how top heavy the light is, and how busy the background becomes and um, you can start to see more darker shadows and highlights. So the highlights and the shadows are, are really separated in this. It's really, really bright and really, really dark. Whereas if I go back to the one um, that's backlit earlier in the morning, it's much softer light. And it's a much smoother, um, smoother transition from the lights to the darks. And so you don't have that um, big gap between the highlights and the, and the shadow area. So, backlight and there is top light again. Here's an example of front light. This is a large, uh, I guess, dinner plate hibiscus. Um, so the sun is almost directly behind me. I'm a little bit out of the way, so I'm not casting a shadow on it. But if you come in tight, don't show a big scene. You can see where there are starting to be deep shadows, but if you're in tight and it illuminates the subject and you have a broad subject that's not very intricate and it's pretty flat, this is where an instance where front light will work fairly well. So just keep that in mind. Hi everyone, it's a beautiful morning here in the garden. I got up early. I'm here at first light. The uh, sun is coming just through the trees there. If you look behind me, you can start to see it hitting the trees back there. It's still very soft in the garden. My subject right here, the zinnia. As you can see, I have it framed up and um, what you want to look for in this situation, this is a backlighting situation, so the sun is there, I'm looking into the sun, my subject is here, and then here's my camera. So uh, practice shooting into the light. This is an ideal situation, early morning, soft light, the shadows are still long, and the light is just starting to come through the trees. As you can see, if you look close on the zinnia, there's a bit of a highlight, the petals are um, being illuminated, almost backlit, there's a nice rim light on this. Um, let me go to this camera. I'm just going to pop this camera off my tripod. This is actually a video tripod, but um, see what I'm doing. I'm going to move that away. So I'm just going to now, I'm just going to move my frame around and take a few shots. If I come down, I'm, you can see there where, I've got to change my exposure a little, where that backlight is really bright, but it get, gives a great mood to the, your photograph. I'm a uh, pretty shallow focus, so uh, the background is going, is blurring and going out of focus, as you can see. And there's a lot to do in this garden. There's a lot of nice plant material. Just a little movement like that, and look how my background goes dark, and it really isolates the plant material. So move around, explore your subject, put it, give it different backgrounds. I'm still just focusing. Move it different places in the frame. Isolate one. Give more of a grouping. Even pull back. And give a wider look to the garden. So there's so much to shoot here and the light is perfect. There's even some fog this morning and a little dew. So there's if you look here closely, you can see some raindrops or moisture on the petals. So, if you're in this situation, beautiful light, up early, so much to shoot, keep moving around the garden, giving your subject different backgrounds, and looking for that special light, that light that's coming through, highlighting your plant material. It will make your pictures pop. Okay, our next bullet point on analyzing the light or learning to see the light is the hard light versus soft light. Those past examples, I did give you some examples of hard light and soft light, but um, 
My first slide here shows uh, Solosha in hard, one in hard light and one in soft light. And you know both of these images are are acceptable. Um, we, we would probably run both of these in the magazine. Um, hard lights on the left, soft lights on the right. So you can see the hard light is um, it does blow out the the color of the plant material a little bit, the bloom. Um, you get some darker shadows there. I mean, it's still usable and it's still nice. So the image on the right, it's, it's softer, um, the colors pop, um, there's no deep shadows. You, you, you really see the foliage and you really see the colors and you really see the, the texture on the, on the flower. So it, moving forward for you, you know, you'll, you'll develop your own style of what you like. Either of these are acceptable. Um, you know, I lean more towards the right uh, image, the softer light. But if you prefer the left light, the harder light, that's fine. Okay, that's that's totally uh, acceptable, and it's still a nice image. So sort of develop your own style, and you'll you'll um, learn to see what you like in the garden. Here's another example of hard light versus soft light. This is a container that we put together that we wanted to um, feature in the magazine. And uh, the image on the left, uh, you know, I, I came out to photograph it and it was, there's a lot of dappled light in the background. The background's very busy. There's not really harsh light hitting the uh, container per se, and I probably could have moved it into a new, new location, but um, we kind of like the, the edge of the paving and the grass back there. So I just came back later in the day. So on the right, you can see the image in soft light. There's some nice fill. I think even the light might be hitting some of the building and bouncing back into the container, filling it, you know, illuminating the front. So if you have the opportunity to come back and be patient and let the light change and look into the sky and see where the light's going, and um, in your head you can think, oh, that'll that might look good in the in the evening. So come back then and you'll get better results. Okay, here's a garden bed that we um, revamped for Garden Gate. This was uh, in one of our old test gardens. And um, I had set up my camera, <clears throat> tripod. Um, the plant material was really looking good. And this is um, probably about, I think it was 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. It wasn't first light, it was a little bit later. Um, so there's some direct light. There, you know, there's some nice um, shadows in it casting along the brick wall but the plant material goes dark and sort of the focus of this image is more of the brick wall than the plant material which we wanted to feature so this hard light is um, creating these deep shadows uh, in the garden bed but it was a cloudy day so clouds were coming and going there was overcast so it was partly cloudy clouds were coming and going so i just kind of waited around again being patient in the garden then I got this shot. So this was um, <clears throat> a cloud had moved in front of the sun. And this is basically total diffusion by a cloud, okay? So there's hardly any shadows anywhere. You can see all the plant material well. There isn't a highlight on the wall at all. And this would be a perfectly acceptable image for us um, because it shows the plant material really well and it, and it it'll de describe the points that we wanted to tell in the magazine. But I kept hanging around and there's that subtle, I had cameras on the tripod, and then there was that time where there's um, a little bit of light coming through a cloud. So you can see so a little dappling of light coming through a tree on the paving and on, on the plant material, especially the hosta in the pot there. But it's not overpowering and it's not creating harsh deep shadows but it's giving a nice highlight to some of the plant material and it's giving a much nicer feel so let me just go back through this you can see this where it's um, full direct light harsh light against the wall totally flat lights totally soft there's no shadows whatsoever and then sort of this in-between shot that which we settled on that we wanted to that we wanted to show in the magazine they gave a little highlight and just gave a nice feel and mood to the, to the photograph. The next component in learning to analyze the light or see the light is angle of light. This first shot, you see the light is coming from the right. It's low in the sky, but it's creating a beautiful ray or cascade of light across the plant material. It's hitting the foliage. It's hitting the plant material 
and it's just illuminating that tapestry of color and providing beautiful interest. And it's, got, it's creating nice lines, which you want in your photograph, and it has a, just a nice balance to it. The next shot, you can see some repetition. You have two rows of ferns here, and how the, the light, again, is coming from the right, but it's illuminating those ferns, the top of those ferns, and, the top, and a nice ribbon of red in the middle. So that angle of light coming from the right, it's not backlight, it's not front light, but the light is low in the sky, it's later in the day, and it's just creating a nice movement of light across the screen. Now here's an example of angle of light. This was a residence we photographed in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I was here, this is an evening shot later in the day. It was overcast. Um, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to get back or not, so I mean, I, I, I shot what I could. Um, but the light's kind of flat. There's not much um, life to it. But I did get a chance to go back the next morning. I got up early, headed over there. And now, relatively the same scene. And the light's to the right, rising up. And it's just creating a nice uh, highlight across the front of the house, across the boulders, across the plant material. The shadow's a little dark, but... Um, uh, not bad, there's still detail in the shadows. So if I go back to that flat light, just flat, it's a usable shot, but it doesn't have that pop or pizzazz that you have when you add some light, low light, long shadows, highlights, just beautiful compared to that first one. Okay, the next component in analyzing light or learning to see the light is manipulating the light. So there's a couple tools I use, a diffuser or fill card, uh, when I can um, to help me with my photographs, especially if I'm, um, it's a smaller area and I can deal with that. So let's take a look and see how I do that. Here's a situation that's a little bit later in the morning. The sun's a little bit higher in the sky. It's not first light anymore, but there's still some nice light, light in the garden. I'm focused on the zinnia, as you can see. The light's nice coming, dappled through a tree. And so it's giving some nice shadows, but this is a situation where I might want to try a diffuser. This is one of the tools I use in the garden um, to help me when the, heart, when the light gets a little bit harsh. Now these can be, you can purchase these diffusers at most photo shops or online. Um, this one I made myself. So this material right here that I use is actually garden row fabric. So a lot of gardeners have this on hand and I just cut a um, circle to fit this uh, frame and I taped it on. Um, but it's nice and compact, it's easy to carry around, and you can just pop it open when you need it. So as you see here, um, the light's pretty nice on it. I mean, it, it, it's lovely, actually. But I'll just show you what this diffuser does in this situation when I bring it in. So if you bring this diffuser in, there you go. I might have to alter my exposure a little bit, just brighten it up. But it just evens everything out. Um, it makes the light a little bit softer, but there's still some direction to the light. You can still see where it's coming from. It's side light but it's just not quite as harsh. So, so you can go from that, if I pull back, and you can see how there's a little bit more um, harsh light on the subject when this is not here. Bring it back in, open up the exposure, and there you go. So it's just one of the tools I carry if you happen to have it. Um, this is another situation where you, know, you, you sometimes have to be patient in the garden. Um, if you see this beautiful bloom, this beautiful flower zinnia, and the light's not quite right, you know, maybe the sun's blasting on it, and it, you're in your own garden and you can come back later in the day, you do that. So just be patient. Just so, oh, I saw that flower. You, you see where the light is. It's too harsh here. Maybe as the sun goes across the sky and it starts setting over there, it might be a better time to photograph this. So just remember to come back and revisit it and shoot it when the light is right. Okay, if you find yourself in a situation where the sun is high, getting higher in the sky, the light on your plant material is really harsh, and there's deep shadows, there's a couple things you can do, a couple things that I carry with me um, as tools to help modify the light. Um, again, it doesn't work on a you know, big garden scene, but um, if you're shooting a, a close-up area or a specific plant, um, these two options work very well. Uh, here I'm focused on a uh, Main Street, Beale Street uh, coleus, and it's got a beautiful color, but it's dark foliage, there's no flowers, um, so it's really about the foliage. It's still fairly early, early in the morning, there's some um, dew on the foliage, so I want that to come out. As you can see, 
I have my camera focused on it right now and it's in this harsh light. And there's a lot of um, deep shadows. Um, you don't see all the detail of the foliage. There's a lot of texture in the foliage there too that you want to bring out and you don't really see that in this light or it's hard to see. So um, I used this earlier, but this diffuser, you know, does a really nice job of knocking down that light. So this would be side light. Um, let me open that up a little bit. You can see what it does. So um, it just evens out, what this does is, is it evens out the light. So there's not such a range between the, the highlights and the shadow area. So um, let me just even open that up one, one time more. And then it brings out the texture more, but there's still direction to the light. The light's coming from the side, but the, you can see some of the uh, more detail in the shadows. So that's a, you know, that's a great solution if you have one of these. If you don't have one of these, another thing you can use is a piece of foam core. Now I, I've just taped this together so it sits down and I can walk away if I want to put it around a plant or something. In this situation I'll probably rest it on the fence here. So as you can see here's here's the scene with sharp light. So if I just bring some foam core in it just opens up that shadow. So this might be a little much. Be careful if you don't want to overfill it. You still want but maybe back here so there it is, you can see with the foam core in. If I pull the foam core out, you can see how the shadows go back dark and deeper. So just bring that in, it opens that up a little bit, evens out the light on your plant material. That's what you wanted to learn, learn how to see the light. So it's really harsh, learn how to even it out, soften the light. Now, if you can manage, if you have a tripod, or if you have an assistant, you could use a combination of these which I do on occasion. So you bring this in and maybe you still want to um, open up the shadows a little bit. You can bring this foam core in just like that and there's your shot. I'm set up here shooting this clematis. One of my favorite flowers to photograph actually. It's got so much um, interest uh, and these old seed heads are beautiful too. So I, I love photographing clematis. Um, this situation is later in the day again, or later in the morning I should say. The sun's high, harsh as you can see on my face. So I have my diffuser just hanging and leaning against the um, archway here. And I also have the fill card that you can see here. So it's just filling in some light. Um, if I take this away you can see there you go. I'm going to bring this in and you can just see how it fills the frame a little bit or fills the shadows a little bit. So, um, so I have this set up. I like the light. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this camera off this tripod and now I'm going to talk about framing a little bit and composition um, with the camera. I'm just going to set this over here. Okay, so you have the camera. Just for video purposes, I'm going to shoot all horizontal, but of course you can shoot vertical, and I'll show you some stills that I did, uh, vertical stills that I did of this. But um, if you see a subject that you want to take a photograph of, a flower, um, it doesn't always have to be right in the center of the frame like this, okay? Have some fun, fun with it, and move your subject around. Gives it a little bit more interest. Here it is in the right side of the frame. Here it is on the left side of the frame. You get a little of the post, right? You can pull back or zoom out, get a little more of the environment around it. Maybe come over this way a little bit. You get some zinnias in the background. My focus is following up there. There you go. Okay, zoom in. Okay, crop some off. Now in this situation, remember again, the light is over here and you know how we like, I've talked about backlighting, that's some of the most beautiful light, the backlighting. So in the, even in the situation where I'm diffusing it, there's still backlight and there's this little bit of dew still on the plant or on the flower, the clematis. And you can actually see my diffuser in there a little bit, but you know, you don't really know what that is. It's a little out of focus, so it's not that big of a deal. You can zoom in a little bit. But you see how that backlight gives nice highlights, it rims the uh, uh, foliage, it get, it's almost translucent. The foliage is coming through and as you move around, 
still nice. It just changes on them. The front light is different. It's not quite as pleasing. There's not as many highlights to it. Um, so even in a situation like this where I'm filling it and I'm using a diffuser, there's still backlight. Okay, here's that shot. Backlight. There it is. Beautiful. Even pull back. So just remember, don't settle for just one shot of your subject in the middle of the, middle of the frame. Move it around, give it some negative space, give your image some negative space, um, up, down, all over the frame, and eventually you'll find that sweet spot with the light and the framing and the composition. Up to this point, we've talked about what you can do to take good pictures. Learn to see the light, analyze the light, and put yourself in a situation to get great images. There are technical aspects of the camera. If you master, it'll just give you another tool to make great images. There's an exposure triangle, and it can be very confusing, but there are three elements to this triangle. The ISO, or speed of the camera, or of the sensor the shutter speed and the aperture. So those three work together. Um, the lower the ISO, like 100, you would use in a bright day. The darker it gets later in the day, you're gonna go to 800 or 1600. If you're on program mode, it would automatically set this. Your phone automatically reads this, so you don't need this. But if you, learn, can, if you can learn to master this, then it'll just give you more um, tools to use to make better photographs. So, for an example, on shutter speeds, of course, the lower the shutter speed, one second, quarter of a second, fifteenth of a second, you're going to see some motion. And it's hard to handhold in that situation. You want to be at least at one sixtieth of a second to handhold. And then if the higher you go up, the more um, you'll be able to freeze the action. And the aperture, the wider the opening or lower the number, 1.42, the more out of focus the background will be. So that's, um, you're gonna want those situations where maybe if you're doing a close up and focusing on a nice flower, you're gonna want that background to go blurry or we call it blown out and not have any details back there. So you want basically a wide opening, like an F2, F2.8, F4. So if you have that, um, it'll give you a softer background. If you want to keep everything sharp if you're shooting a larger scene and you want something uh, focused in the front and focused in the back then you're going to go have to go to a higher aperture which is a, actually a smaller opening in the lens so you want f11 or f16 or it even goes up to f22 so all three of those you have to find a um, region that works best for you uh, I took some examples here in this slide exposure comparison so it's a, the Zinni again you saw earlier. So I just set my camera at ISO 400. It's early in the morning. So it's a good, 400 is a pretty good uh, basic ISO to set your camera at. So the first shot I could have easily handheld. It's, this is on a tripod just for comparison purposes, but I could easily handhold at one 250th of a second and F4. That's as, uh, the lowest opening that my camera had, um, this lens had but it really does a nice job of blowing out the background, making the background soft, and it really makes your uh, subject in the foreground pop. And then my next one to the right, so I went a little bit slower, one, one twenty-fifth of a second, and so I had to um, compensate on my exposure and made my exposure at f5.6. So the opening in the lens went from four to five, six, so that means the opening in the lens got smaller, so I needed to make a longer exposure so more light would hit the sensor. And you can start to see where the background comes more in focus. And then my next one, again, I stopped down to F8, so I'm making the background more in focus. There's more depth of field. There's deep focus, this is called, so how deep the focus is. So since I made that opening in the aperture smaller, F8, to make things more sharp, 
I had to make the exposure longer. So the equal, amount, equal amounts of light hit the sensor or film if you're using film. Again, this doesn't relate to phones at all. That, that compensates itself, but I'll, I'll give you a few tips with what you can do with a phone too to um, create depth of field. So uh, the second to last image there is F11. And so again, I had to open up, that's one stop from F8 to F11, and 60th to 30th of a second. So again, a longer exposure, I'm on the tripod, so I'm not showing blur, any movement, if there's any breeze or anything. So it's all the same exposure, but it's just different depth of field. And then finally, F16, for this lens, it's the um, highest depth of field I could get, and I'm, that's at 1 15th of a second. So that kind of gives you an idea um, what the different f-stops will do in exposure. So just for example, on that last image, let's say I was at ISO 200. So that means the sensor has less sensitivity. So 200 from 400, so that's one stop. So I would have to move one of the shutter speeds or the f-stop. So I would probably go to one eighth of a second on that instance and leave it at f16 if I was at ISO 200. So all three work together. I just happened to leave the 400 um, on this one. So as I scroll through, I've blown these images up for you. So here is the image at f4. So the background is um, most out of focus in this one. Then as I go through, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16. So it just gradually gets a little bit sharper as the opening in the lens closes, but I do have to make a longer exposure. So that's kind of what that does. I'll go back through there. There's 11, 8, 5, 6, 4. So in this instance, in this instance um, depending on what we want to use it for in the magazine, Perhaps we would use this F4 where the background's out of focus. And then, like I did here with the label, we could put some text there or a headline or a title, something like that. So it's always nice to maybe think about leaving some negative space in your imagery. One of the questions I always get is, what kind of camera are you using? So I thought I'd share with you what's in my bag. I'm a Canon photographer and I use the Canon 5D Mark IV. It's a 30 megapixel um, camera and it uh, creates raw files and which I use Capture One software to process the raw files and um, I get about a 60 megabyte file with a full frame uh, file. So the the good thing about this camera it is a full frame sensor or it's a 35 millimeter sensor so whatever your lens whatever lens you're using, it's a true lens. There are some cameras out there that are, uh, the sensor is a half sensor, or smaller sensor, so that basically doubles the size of your lens. Um, this is a 24-105 lens from Canon. Uh, this is probably my workhorse lens. I have this on the camera the most. Um, it does have image, image stabilization as well, so when you're shooting um, with a lower shutter speed. It just helps stabilize the image if you're handheld. So it's a great lens. Um, at 24, you can get wide garden shots. And at 105, you can focus in on plant material nice. It's also um, you know, a nice portrait lens if you want to take portraits of your family, pictures of your kids. 105 is a good uh, focal length to do that with. I also use a 100 macro lens from Canon. It also has image stabilization. It's a great lens for close-ups, uh, flower details, bugs, anything that's smaller that the 24 to 105 can't get. Um, I put the 100 macro on um, and it just it does a nice job of um, making the background blurry out of focus too at, at a lower f-stop so that helps a lot. Love that lens. And then I have this, the, the uh, 70 to 200 from Canon. Again, it has image stabilization, so it helps uh, balance your camera a little bit. Um, I probably use this one least, but I, I, I really like this lens. It gives a different perspective, um, especially at 200. Um, it, it compresses the frame a little bit, so if I have a flower here that I'm focusing on and um, I want to like bring the background closer. It sort of compresses the scene a little bit. It does a great job of um, making the background go, you know, blurry 
and out of focus and um, it's very versatile too because it goes to 70 so you can do a lot of things with that and then I just have some you know extra batteries uh, like a cable release um, several different cards but this is my basic setup right here what I use um, when I'm done shooting I do use capture one software to process my uh, raw images and output them and then we use Photoshop to fine-tune those images for the magazine so that's basically my setup there hi I just wanted to show you uh, some different focal lengths of the lens I know it's really bright and harsh here um, it's later in the morning but um, I have my 24 to 105 lens. It's basically my workhorse lens. It's the one I uh, probably have on the camera the most, uh, especially when I'm walking through a gardens or shooting a garden. So right now, I'm at uh, a focal length of 24 millimeters. The front of the bed to the camera is about 20 feet, more or less. Um, so it, it's a wide pan panoramic. Um, one thing I want to mention about this too is that um, even though the light is harsh, on a wider scene, uh, you know, it might, it might not matter so much. So, for example, if you're on a garden tour or you're, you know, stuck in the middle of the day uh, and you can't do anything with the light and you're just walking through a garden, I mean, hey, take pictures, you know, it's good to have pictures. But when the scene's big and, and, the, and the sun's behind the camera here, it's not the worst. I mean, it still shows nice blue sky, green grass, the colors pop. You know, it's, it's those situations where if you want to come in tighter and shoot some plant material, that's when you're going to see more of the deep shadows, um, things like that. So if you're on a wide uh, perspective, wide panoramic, you know, go ahead and shoot. It's not, it's not the worst situation. It's not the ideal light. I mean, we don't have a diffuser like we do. Um, you know, a cloud acts like a diffuser too. It's just a huge, giant diffuser. So when it's overcast and you're shooting, um, you don't have those harsh shadows and um, the light's more even. So that's a nice situation to shoot, but this, this isn't the worst. All right, let me show you the different focal lengths, okay? Okay, so this is a 24 millimeter right here, 24 to 105 millimeter lens. So I'm at a focal length of 24 right now, okay? The next obvious one is 35, it's just a slight movement, okay? Then I'll go to 50 millimeters. So this is a typical lens. Sometimes you get a 50 millimeter lens when you buy a, a camera. That's just a, the lens that comes with it. Okay, then I'll zoom into 70. A lot of times you'll see a 24 to 70 millimeter zoom. So that's 70 millimeters. And here is all the way to 105. So you can see the difference there from 105. I'll just do a quick pull out to 24. Back to 105. So this lens, the reason I like it is it gives um, a lot of variety from 24 to 105. And when I'm shooting close-ups, uh, the 105 looks good. So even if you're taking portraits of your family, 105, 105 millimeter is a, a great lens or a great focal length to have. I have my phone set up on this simple arrangement of uh, petunias and some gomfrina on my deck. Uh, I have an iPhone XS Max, uh, so I can only tell you kind of what my camera does. Make sure you read your manual or watch tutorials on how to use your own phone uh, camera on your phone because it all, every, everyone will have different settings. But um, I can at least tell you a little bit about uh, my camera, or my, the camera on my phone. Um, so here I'm just in the standard setting photo. I turned it on. Um, I can take a photo. You just press the button there. Okay, so you can also zoom in. You know, if you want to get a detail, it does a nice job on that too. Very nice. I took a shot. So just looking at that scene, again, it's late in the day. The light's coming in from the sun is setting. It's coming through the trees. But, it, you know, it gives a nice highlight. The Gomfrina is illuminated on the one side. It's the angle of light that's coming in. Um, one thing that's nice about this setting, I'll zoom back out. If you go to portrait, okay, so it's a little bit higher scene. So you can see how it starts to um, 
make the depth of field or focus in the background go a little bit softer. So this is a ni nice feature. Um, and so, but one thing that you can do on this, if you take the photo, I want to show you. Okay, there you go. And it comes up here in the lower left hand corner and you open that up and you hit edit. Okay, of, of course here, right now we're on natural light. There's different light, studio light. It does a few different things. You know, um, in this instance, stage light doesn't work. Stage light doesn't really do much, but there are different settings there for different uses. So I'd like to keep it on natural. But then you go up here and you look at, it has F4, 5. So that's the F stops that we talked about. So if you click on that, and let's see, click on that, then it comes up down here and you can alter the F stop. So right now it says F4, 5 go down to 1.4 and I, as I move this you can see the background. Now I'm up to F16 and see how the depth of field is much deeper, the focus is um, longer, the gomphrina and the uh, evergreen in the back are sharp and then you go down, this goes down to 1.4 and so now just the center is in focus, the background isn't in as much as in focus. So that's a nice feature on the iPhone and I like soft focus so I'm going to hit done and there's my image. Hey thanks for joining me today. I had a great time putting this together. If there's one thing you take from the whole thing it's just learn how to analyze that light. Backlight, front light, top light, soft light, hard light. See the light okay that's the most important thing. Good light makes good photographs. Good luck.